So in this lab, we're going to cover lab eight, which is going to be looking at diffusion and osmosis. So we're going to talk now about diffusion. And diffusion is the movement of molecules or ions from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. And so I want you to imagine for a minute that you have a beaker of water or a glass of water. If you take that glass of water and you put in drops of food coloring, for example, you'll notice that when you put that food coloring in, those drops of dye don't stay as drops forever. That dye is going to start to move and spread out. It's going to go from its high concentration as a drop to the low concentration, which is the water around it, right? Because when you put the drop in, the high concentration is where you put it in. The low concentration is going to be the water around it. And so those dye molecules are going to move from a high concentration to a low concentration. And they'll continue to move and they'll continue to, to um, spread out until eventually they're evenly distributed in the, in the water. And at that point, we would say that they've reached equilibrium. Now, when we talk about things going from a high concentration to low, you'll hear the term going down the concentration gradient. And if you think about it, going from high concentration to low, right? So that dye going from its high concentration to low, that's a favorable reaction. That will happen on its own. I don't have to do anything to make those dye molecules spread out. And so when we talk about a concentration gradient, there's two ways. Things can go up a concentration gradient or they can go down. And now think about which one is more favorable, which one's gonna happen spontaneously. Will things roll, let's say, down a hill or spontaneously will they go up a hill? And you guys probably all know based on gravity that by default, without anything happening, things would go down a hill. That's a spontaneous process. Going down a hill doesn't require anything. Going up a hill, though, requires energy. And so diffusion, because we're going from higher to lower, and that's favorable, and that happens spontaneously, we say that that's moving these molecules down the concentration gradient. And again, this is a spontaneous process. No energy is required, but it is dependent on the thermal motion of molecules because remember that molecules have inherent movement. They bounce around. And if you think about what you learned back when you were a kid, if you heat something up, what happens to molecular motion? And if you think about it for a minute, you might recall that if you heat something up, molecules move faster. And so if those molecules are starting to move faster, do you think that diffusion is going to happen faster at warmer temperatures or at cooler temperatures? And so think about that for a minute. Will it happen faster at warmer temperatures or at cooler temperatures? And you might come up with that it's going to happen faster at warmer temperatures because at warmer temperatures, molecular motion is going to speed up, which means that those molecules are going to move faster and they're going to evenly distribute at a faster rate. And so again, the molecules are going to bounce around and eventually spread out until they reach equilibrium. And so here's a different example of this. Here on the left, we have this beaker and it has a membrane. And this membrane is permeable to the dye, meaning that these molecules of dye can cross the membrane. And so if we put dye only on one side, these molecules of dye are gonna move from their higher concentration on the left to the lower concentration on the right. But notice that the dye molecules don't exclusively go to the right. Some of them by chance will happen to go back to the left. It's just that net movement, meaning uh, it's more going to be towards the right. And those molecules are gonna move towards the right until they evenly spread out, at which point we would say that they're at equilibrium. Now, when molecules reach equilibrium, does that mean they stop moving? And the answer is no, 
Molecules always move even at equilibrium. It's just that those molecules don't have net movement, meaning they're not going one way or the other faster in either direction. The movement to the right equals the movement to the left. And so that's an important concept is molecules always move even at equilibrium. So water also has thermal motion and it will also bounce around and work to spread out. And water will also move down the concentration gradient, meaning that it will go from its high concentration, so that's what these brackets represent, that refers to concentration. So it's gonna go from its high water concentration to its low water concentration. And so to understand how this works, we need to kind of review and talk about water. And so remember that water, H2O, is an oxygen covalently bound to two hydrogens. And if you remember back to our water lecture, you'll remember that water is polar, meaning that even though oxygen and hydrogen share electrons, they don't share equally. And that has to do again with electronegativity. And if you remember back to that lecture, and we talked about electronegativity, is oxygen or is hydrogen more electronegative? And so remember that we said that the atom that is going to have a greater electronegativity is going to be the one that has its outer shell more full. And so if you remember back to oxygen, oxygen has six valence electrons in its second shell of electrons, which means that oxygen only needs two more to fill its outer shell. Hydrogen, on the other hand, has one electron in its first shell and it only needs one more to fill its outer shell. So hydrogen is only half full, whereas oxygen has six out of eight, meaning it's more than half full. And so if you think about oxygen and hydrogen, that then means that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. And what that means is that because it's more electronegative, when they share electrons, they don't share equally. It's like a tug of war. Oxygen wants those electrons more, and so the electrons are going to spend more time around the oxygen and less time around the hydrogen. And so as oxygen pulls harder for those electrons, oxygen gets a partial negative charge because electrons are negative, and if the negatively charged electrons spend more time around oxygen, it's a partial negative charge, which means then that the hydrogens get a partial negative positive charge. And that's because the electron spends more time with oxygen, which leaves hydrogens as just a proton, and the electron is spending more of the time around oxygen, so it's partially positive. And so what you get is water, again, is polar. It has a part that's partially negative, which is the oxygen, and a part that's partially positive, which is the hydrogens. Now, when we talked about solutes, remember that a solute is something that dissolves in water. So in this diagram, this diagram showing it as a sugar, but it just as easily could be something like uh, salt, right? You know that you can dissolve salt in water. So I'm gonna show you a diagram using salt as an example, because it's a little more simple. And if you remember back to our lecture talking about salt, Salt, remember, is just simply sodium ions and chloride ions. And sodium ions are positively charged. Chloride ions are negatively charged. And so remember that when we talked about interactions between atoms, opposites attract. And so what's going to happen is that negatively charged chloride ion is going to be attracted to the partial positive hydrogens. And we get these hydration shells. Sodium, on the other hand, has a positive charge, and it's going to interact with that partially negative oxygen. And so what happens is, is the reason that salt dissolves in water is because the water molecules interact with the sodium and the chloride, and they separate them from each other. So if on the left you have a lower solute concentration, and on the right you have a solute, higher solute concentration, that means that 
on the right side where we have more sugar, we have less free water. And what I mean by this is in this case, this membrane is selectively permeable. And what that means is that some things can cross the membrane, others cannot. And in this case, our solute is not able to get across the membrane. Only the water can move. And so we can't say that the solute is going to move from the right to the left because it can't cross the membrane. So what we need to focus on is which direction the water will move. And so to think about which way the water will move, wherever we have a higher solute concentration, wherever that solute's present, water is going to be attached to it. And if you remember, the solute can't cross the membrane. And so on this side where we have more, uh, more solutes, we have less free water because the water is not free to move. It's bound to the solute. On this left side here, we have a lower, lower concentration of solutes, but we have more free water, more water that's not bound to a solute that's free to move. And so we have more free water here, less free water here. And remember that things are going to go always from high concentration to low. So it's going to go from its high concentration of water here to low concentration of water here. And water is going to move to the right and it's going to start to fill up the tube on this side. And so again, just like all other molecules, water is also going to move from a high concentration to low. And when you're looking for which way water moves, it's always going to be from the low solute concentration, which is where you're going to have more free water, to the high solute concentration, where you have less free water. So either way is fine to remember it if you want to remember that it moves from low solute to high solute. But for me, I would rather remember that things always go from high to low. And so I always like to remember that it's going to move from here, where it has more free water or a higher water concentration, to this side, where it has a lower water concentration. And so this is going to be referred to as osmosis. Okay, and osmosis is the diffusion of water. Now, tonicity is the ability of a solution to cause a cell to gain or to lose water. And you always need to compare two solutions because water or a cell is only going to gain or lose water depending on solute concentration. And in order for this to work, it must be separated by a water permeable membrane, meaning that water can move. Because how can a cell gain or lose water if water can't move? And you have to be really careful when you start talking about tonicity because you need to pay attention to which of the two solutions you're referring to. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. So the first one that we'll talk about is a hypertonic solution. And if you think of a kid that's hyperactive, do they have more energy or less energy? And you'll probably recall that if a kid is hyperactive, they have more energy. So the word hyper refers to more. The hypertonic solution is the one that has a higher solute concentration. And so notice that in this case, here in white, this is our cell, and our cell is placed in a solution, and that solution has more solutes outside. And so we would say that the solution outside is hypertonic relative to the cell because again, hyper means more. So this solution is hypertonic relative to the cell. And remember that anywhere that solute is, water is gonna be associated with it. So all these little red dots here are referring to water. And notice that if there's more solutes outside, that means that this outside solution has less free water. Notice that there's only, in this case, one water molecule that's free to move. If we look inside the cell, which has a lower solute concentration, it's going to have more free water because the solute concentration is lower and there's more water molecules that are free to move. 
So inside the cell, we have more free water. And so think about it for a minute. Which way is the water going to move? Is it going to go into the cell or is it going to go out of the cell? And so think about it. So where is the water going to go? And if you think about it, it's going to go from its high concentration inside the cell to the low concentration outside. And what you're going to see is that water is going to move out of the cell. Now, we're going to talk about for each of these solutions what you're going to see in both an animal cell and in a plant cell. And remember that a difference between plant and animal cells is that plant cells have a rigid cell wall. Animal cells do not. And so this is going to affect the way that water moves in a plant cell versus an animal cell. So in an animal cell, when the water moves out from a hypertonic solution, so as the water goes out, animal cell is going to shrivel up. For the plant cell, the water is still going to go out, but the whole cell is not going to shrivel up because it has that rigid cell wall. Instead, you're going to see something called plasmolysis. And what that means is that as the water goes out, the cell membrane is going to shrink in away from the cell wall. So it's like the membrane kind of collapses in, but the cell wall stays out here. And so in plant cells, this is referred to as plasmolysis. And you're actually going to visualize this um, in lab this week. Now, let's look at what's going to happen if you place a cell in a hypotonic solution. And hypo is less. So remember that if hyper is more, hypo is the opposite, it's less. So in this case, it's the solution with a lower solute concentration. So in this case, the, the solution outside is hypotonic relative to the cell because it has a lower solute concentration compared to the cell. And so when we look at water concentration, remember that if we have more solutes inside, less solutes outside, that means that we have more free water outside. And so think about it, which way is the water going to move if you put a cell in a hypotonic solution? And so if you think about it, water is going to go from its high concentration in the solution to the low concentration inside the cell. And the water in this case is going to move into the cell. And the way that I remember that is if you put a cell in a hypotonic solution, water is going to go in, the cell is going to swell, and it's going to become a big O. So hype O, cell is going to become a big O. Okay, and so water is going to go in, cell is going to swell. And so that's going to look different if you talk about an animal cell versus a plant cell. In an animal cell, if you put it in a hypotonic solution, the water's going to go in, the cell's going to swell, there's no cell wall to restrain how much water goes in, and the cell's going to lyse and it's going to burst open. Think about for a minute if you've ever been dehydrated and you had to go to the hospital to get an IV. You probably know that if you go to the hospital, they're not going to put pure water into your IV. They're going to put a saline solution and that's because they don't want to create a hypotonic solution outside your cells so that all the water is going to rush in and your cells are going to burst or lice open. And you can actually die from water intoxication. It's something called hyponatremia and it happens sometimes in marathon runners when they sweat too much if they drink just pure water you create a hypotonic environment outside the cells, too much water goes in, and your cells would start to lice. And so again, this is why in a hospital, if you're dehydrated, they're not gonna put pure water in there. They're gonna put a saline solution that has some solutes so that you don't have too much water rushing into your cell. If you think about a plant cell, however, if you water a plant, 
you don't use salt water or saline to water your plant. You just use tap water where the solute concentration is low. You are putting your plant in a hypotonic solution. And in a plant cell, that's actually a favorable reaction because as the water goes in, it creates some pressure inside that cell and that makes the cell become turgid. It creates what's called turgor pressure. And that pressure inside the cell from the inside pushing on the cell wall, that pressure is gonna make the cell very rigid, very firm, and that's what allows the plant to stand upright. It needs that turgor pressure. So in a plant, you wanna put the plant cell in a hypotonic solution because you want the water to go in to create that pressure. But again, animal cell, not good to put it in a hypotonic solution because the water is gonna go in, no cell wall to restrain it, and the water is gonna cause the cell to go pop and burst open, that's called lysis. Now, back to the slide about tonicity, and I said about um, always make sure to pay attention to which solution you're paying it, or which solution you're talking about, so notice in this case, we can say that the solution, the solution is hypotonic, but the cell we could also call hypertonic. So we could say that the cell is hypertonic relative to the solution, right? It has more solutes relative to the solution. So again, always be careful when you're using the terms hypertonic and hypotonic, which one are you referring to? Are you talking about the solution or are you talking about inside the cell? And so in this scenario, the solution is hypotonic relative to the cell, or you could say the cell is hypertonic relative to the solution. And the last scenario is if you put a cell in an isotonic solution. Iso refers to same. And this is where you have an equal solute concentration on both sides of the membrane. So notice one, two, three, one, two, three, solute concentration is the same, which means that the water concentration is also the same. Notice one, two free water molecules, one, two. And so what that means is you have an equal concentration of water on either side of the membrane. And so think about that for a minute. Does that mean that the water won't move? And if you think about it, right, you might recall that molecules always move even at equilibrium. And so it's not that you don't get any movement. You just don't get net movement. Water is going to go into the cell and out of the cell at the same rate. And so the water is equally going to move in both directions. So if you put an animal cell in an isotonic solution, water is going to go in and out at the same rate. That's going to be a normal animal cell. Again, you want your cells to be in an isotonic solution. For a plant cell, however, that's not a good thing. Again, you want that pressure inside the cell in order to make the cell firm so that the plant stands up. If you were to water your plant with an isotonic solution where the water is going into and out of the cell, the cell is going to be flaccid. And if it's flaccid, it's not firm and your plant's going to wilt. And so best scenario for an animal cell, isotonic solution, best scenario for a plant cell would be to actually put it in a hypotonic solution so that the water goes in. So this animation is showing you diffusion across a membrane. And so what you're seeing is you see this dotted line and the dotted line is basically where um, this membrane is located. So you can see here is this membrane and in the membrane, you start out with those red dye molecules. In this example, uh, the membrane is permeable to the dye, meaning that the dye is able to move from its high concentration inside the membrane to its low concentration outside the membrane. 
and the dye molecules will move until equilibrium is reached, until those dye molecules are evenly spread out. Now, what you wanna be aware is that not all membranes are gonna be permeable to everything, meaning that in some cases, a membrane might not be permeable to the dye. Uh, maybe the dye molecules are larger than the size of the pores in that membrane. And so membranes are often selectively permeable, meaning that they have some things that can cross on their own and others that cannot. So what I want you to do here is I want you to brainstorm and come up with a list of variables that can affect the rate of diffusion. Meaning, what are some things that you think might have an effect on the rate of diffusion? And so when you get a second, go ahead and pause your video, think about it, see if you can come up with a list, and when you're ready, go ahead and turn back on your video so that you can um, get this list with me. All right, so here is our list. So the first one that we'll come up with is going to be temperature. And if you think about it, temperature is a measurement of molecular motion. Basically, it's a measurement of heat of how much these molecules move. So if you think about heating something up, right? If I were to take water and I were to heat it, what happens to molecular motion as temperature increases, right? And so if you think about it, if you heat something up, molecules move faster. So we can put increase in temperature, molecules move faster, right? So as we increase our temperature, our molecules are going to move faster. So what I want you to think about then is, and on the first page of your lab that you're gonna write your answers, um, the first part is asking you to make a prediction for how temperature affects the rate of diffusion. Meaning, <clears throat> do you predict that the higher the temperature, the faster the rate of diffusion? Or do you predict that the lower the temperature, the faster the rate of diffusion? And so you're going to, on your lab, um, you're going to predict what you think will happen in the experiment. And you're actually gonna do an experiment that's going to test this. You're gonna have three beakers of water, you're gonna add food coloring to those beakers, and you're gonna see under which temperature condition do you see the fastest rate of diffusion. And so you want to predict which temperature, higher or lower, would you expect diffusion rate to be faster. And again, you wanna think of this as um, temperature is a rate of molecular motion. So if I increase temperature, molecules move faster. So would you predict that that's gonna make diffusion faster or slower? And so that's one of the things that you're going to do. Another thing, another variable that can affect the rate of diffusion is molecular weight. Right, how big those molecules are. And so again, this is going to be an experiment that you are going to do. Um, you're gonna look at the effect of molecular weight on the rate of diffusion. And so what you wanna think about is, do you predict that the lower molecular weight, meaning it, think of it like it weighs less. So do you predict that the lower the molecular weight, the faster the rate of diffusion? Or do you predict that the higher the molecular weight, the faster the rate of diffusion. So you wanna come up with a prediction on your lab about what you think in terms of the correlation between molecular weight and diffusion. So higher or lower molecular weight is going to diffuse faster. So that's your variable. Um, so we have temperature, we have molecular weight, we have solute concentration. And so remember that solute is something that is being dissolved, right? And so depending on the concentration of the solute, that is going to affect diffusion. 
if we, let's say, have a semi-permeable membrane, right, and on one side of the membrane we have solutes and those solutes can cross the membrane, right, then those solutes are going to diffuse across the membrane from their high concentration to lower. So solute concentration can also affect diffusion, uh, pressure, right, so if you increase pressure, um, it can cause molecular motion to, uh, to increase, which then could lead to faster rate of diffusion. And so these are just some of the examples and some of the things that are going to be tested in this lab to look at how these variables affect the rate of diffusion. So what you're seeing in this animation is the yellow represents the membrane. And the red and blue, those are the water, right? And the red part is going to be the oxygen. And the blue are the two hydrogens because water is H2O. And so if you look at this, right, what you're looking at is this orange is the solute. Notice on this side, which is labeled the cytoplasm, so in the cell, we have more solute, which means outside the cell, we have more free water, more water that's free to move. And so that free water is going to move into the cell, right? Because again, this is going to be a hypotonic solution out here. It has less solute, more free water, and the water is gonna go across the membrane and it's gonna diffuse um, into the cytoplasm. And so you would end up with net movement of water into the cell. Now, in your body, your kidneys are responsible for filtering, um, filtering the blood. And so what you're looking at is your kidneys. Here's the, your kidney. And you have two um, on either side in your lower back region. And you can see these blood vessels that are going into the kidneys. And within them, they have what are called nephrons. And at these nephrons, the blood is going to flow and it's going to lead to exchange of materials from the blood to the kidney. And the reason for this is that your body is going to excrete these waste and excrete this excess water as urine. And so your kidneys are going to be responsible for filtering the blood and also for exchange of materials. And so let's look at how that works. So your kidneys, again, are responsible for filtering your blood, and they do so by diffusion. So if you think about it, if your blood has a lot of solutes in it, right? If your blood has a lot of solutes in it, the solutes are going to move from their high concentration to their low concentration, and they're going to move into the urine where they can be excreted as waste. So you can see these little pink ones have a net movement into the urine. Now, also as a result, if we have a lot of solutes in the blood, that means that our free water concentration is low in the blood. And so you're going to get net movement of water from the urine back into the blood. And that is going to lead to, so if you don't have enough water, right? So let's say you're not drinking enough water throughout the day. The water is going to go from the urine back into the blood. And what's going to happen is, is that as a result, because your body's reabsorbing the water, you end up with very concentrated urine. And so if you think about it, if you've ever, you know, looked at your urine, um, your urine color kind of gives you an idea of um, if you are dehydrated or if you're getting an excess of water. Because if you think about it, if water is going back into the blood, would you expect that your urine is going to be darker or would you expect that your urine is going to be very pale yellow? And so you probably know this if you've ever been dehydrated, that your urine is going to be very dark. Your urine is going to be very concentrated because the water has gone back into the bloodstream and is no longer in the urine. And therefore, as a result, um, the urine is going to be very concentrated and very dark. On the flip side, if you are getting enough water, if you're drinking an excess of water, 
what's going to happen in that case is that if you're getting enough water, right, and you have an excess of water now in the blood, that excess water in the blood is going to come out and into the urine where the water concentration is lower. And when the water goes into the urine and you now urinate, right, now your urine is going to be a very pale yellow color. And so by looking at the color of your urine, it kind of gives you an idea of if, um, if you are getting enough water through the day. So you don't want your urine to be a very dark, dark color. That would indicate you're not getting enough water and the water is being absorbed back into the bloodstream, which is why the urine is very concentrated. And so again, the kidneys are responsible for filtering the blood by diffusion and it concentrates the urine by osmosis. So after the kidneys produce the um, urine, so here you can see here are your kidneys. Each kidney is about the size of a fist. And the kidneys, again, are going to produce that urine. The kidneys produce it. The urine is going to travel down these tubes called ureters. They're going to be stored. The urine is going to be stored in the bladder. And then the bladder is going to release that urine when you urinate. And so your bladder contracts. And when your bladder contracts, that's when it's going to release the urine and you're going to urinate. And so your kidneys, though, are what are initially producing that urine and then sending that urine down the ureters to the bladder. And then the bladder is going to release that as waste when you urinate. So I have a couple practice problems just to kind of get you um, along the idea of understanding diffusion. So the first one I'm going to ask you is that you have a plant. And yes, I have lovely drawing skills. And so here's my plant. And it's in its little pot here. Okay, so I have my little flower. And let's say that the solute concentration inside the leaves, inside the plant, uh, the solute concentration is about, we're just estimating, we're coming up with random numbers, 0.3%. So inside my flower, um, the concentration of solutes is 0.3%. Now let's say I add salt water. So let me change my ink here. So I go to water my plant and I water it with salt water. Now my salt water, let's say, is 20% solutes, meaning 20% salt. So what you want to think about in this case is if I have my cell, so let me change my ink back. So here is my plant cell. And inside the plant cell, we have a solute concentration of about 0.3%. And outside the cell, we have 20% salt. Right, so we have a much, much higher solute concentration outside the cell. So now I want you to think that if I have more solute, right, if I have more solute outside, first of all, what do I call the solution outside of the plant cell? Is it hypertonic, hypotonic, or isotonic? And the answer is that it is hypertonic. The salt water is hypertonic, uh, relative to the plant cell. So if my solution outside is hypertonic, I have more solutes. And if I have more solutes, remember that anywhere that there's solutes, the red is the water. Anywhere that there's solutes, water is going to be associated with it. So where do I have more free water? Do I have more free water inside the plant cell or outside the plant cell? 
So if you think about it, inside the plant cell, I have less solutes, which means I have more free water. So more free water. And so because I have more free water, the water is at a higher concentration in the plant cell than it is outside. So is the water going to move into the plant cell or out of the plant cell? So think about that for a minute. And if you said it's going to go out, if the water is going to go out, you're correct. So water moves out because we have more free water inside the plant cell. And so the water is going to leave the cell. It's going to come out of the cell. And when that happens, when in remember in a plant cell, when it loses water, you're going to see that plant cell, um, you're going to see that cell membrane collapse in. You might recall that you saw this in our microscopes lab. One of the things that we talked about was that when we did the experiment with the elodia, or when we looked at that, right, if we took the elodia and we put a drop of salt water on the leaf, what we saw was we saw that when the water went out, the cell membrane collapsed in, and we were able to see where the edge of the cell membrane is. Because again, under normal conditions, the cell wall and cell membrane are right up next to each other. But when the water leaves the cell and the membrane collapses in, right, when the membrane collapses in because the water has left, uh, that is called plasmolysis. Now, this also goes along the lines of, if you think about um, canned fruit, for example, right? Canned fruit often is stored in a high sugar solution. And you might think that that's counterintuitive because if we put it in high sugar, wouldn't you think that maybe bacteria or other contaminants might grow better in that solution because they want to use that sugar as a food source? But what you have to think about is bacterial cells, um, cells that would contaminate food. Bacterial cells, if you put them in a high sugar solution, you are now putting them in a hypertonic solution. And so what happens to any bacteria that might be in there is that the bacteria is also going to undergo plasmolysis. The water is going to go out of the bacterial cells and it's going to inhibit that bacteria from growing. And so that's why we store um, food products in high solute concentrations because it actually helps to inhibit microbial growth. Even though it's sugary and even though bacteria might like to use it as a food source, because that solution is hypertonic relative to um, the bacterial cell, the water is going to come out of the bacteria, which is going to cause bacteria to undergo plasmolysis and the bacteria, bacterial cells not going to be able to um, grow and multiply. And so that's why food um, is stored in high solute concentrations. It helps to inhibit microbial growth. Now, if you think about it, right, if I water a plant cell, am I going to normally water the plant with salt water? Answer is no, because if the water is going to leave the plant cell, and the cell membrane shrinks in, well, now my plant loses its turgor pressure, it loses that pressure in um, being going into the cell, and when that happens, the plant is going to wilt. So your lab has another question about a sea star and putting it into a water solution. So I have a slide in here later but you wanna make sure that when you're answering that problem, it's along the same lines as this, but a different setup. Um, you want to include, is the water that you're putting the sea star in hypertonic, hypotonic, or isotonic? You want to discuss where is there more free water? Is there more water inside the sea star cell or in the solution? 
And you want to discuss in your answer which way the water moves. Did the water go into the sea star or did the water go out? And so this is just to show you an example of how a problem like this would work using a different scenario. <laughs> so in this experiment for this week, uh, there are three parts to this lab. Part number one is looking at the effect of solute concentration on osmosis. And so again, I'm gonna put the link in a minute, but there's another video that actually shows the setup and shows Professor Liu um, demonstrating how this lab is done. And the video also provides you with the data, but I just wanted to kind of summarize it here to give you an idea what that might look like. So what we do in this experiment is we take dialysis tubing. Now, dialysis tubing is semi-permeable. Only things that are small enough are able to cross the dialysis tubing. Think of it like being analogous to the cell membrane, right? Your cell membrane is also semi-permeable. Some things can cross and other things cannot. And so this dialysis tubing is semi-permeable. And so what you would do in this lab is you would take four dialysis tubes, you would seal one end, and then you would add 10 milliliters of a urine solution and add it into the bag. You would then seal off the other end so that you end up with this bag that's sealed with 10 milliliters of urine in it. You would gently blot the outside of the dialysis tube with paper towels to get rid of any excess water that's on the outside of the um, dialysis tubing because when we do this, dialysis tubing is actually stored in water. It has to be hydrated to make the membrane soft. Um, so you would have to blot the outside of the bag with a paper towel. Now, you would need to make four of these. So you would make four of these dialysis tubes um, and they would each contain 10 milliliters of urine. Now, the idea here is in this experiment, again, we're looking at the effect of solute concentration on osmosis. So when you make one of the bags, it's gonna go into a solution that is deionized water, basically meaning it's 0% solutes. It has no ions, there's no solutes. You're going to put one of those dialysis tubes in a point or in a 5% solute concentration. You're gonna put another one in a 10%, and the last one is gonna go into a 15% solute concentration. And what we're trying to do in this experiment is we wanna know, does the water go into the bag or out? Because depending on the movement of water, that is going to tell us the relative concentration of the solute inside the dialysis bag. Right, We know the solute concentration outside. What we're trying to determine in this experiment is what is the solute concentration inside the bag? That's what we're looking for, right? And so to figure out if water goes into or out of the bag through osmosis, how we're going to measure this is that we're going to record the weight before and after it's placed in those solutions. So you would make your four dialysis tubes, you would fill them with the urine, seal them off, and then you would take that urine bag and you would weigh it on the scale and record the starting weight. Now you have to do that for each of your four bags separately because they're not likely to weigh all the same weight. There's gonna be some variation. So you would need to weigh all four bags and record the weight of the bags. The other thing that's important when you do this is if you were actually doing this in the lab, you would not want to take those bags, weigh it, and then put it back in a pile. Because if you do that, if you keep them all together, what's gonna happen is, is you're gonna lose track of which bag weighed which amount. So when actually doing this, you would have your four beakers with you, and as soon as you weigh it, I would recommend that you would put that bag in that corresponding beaker so that you keep track that that bag weighed that amount. So you record the starting weight, then you would submerge the dialysis tube in the corresponding solution. 
So the deionized water, the 5% solute, the 10%, or the 15th. So you would submerge the bag, meaning it has to cover the top of the bag, and you would let it sit for 45 minutes. So you're giving time for osmosis to happen. After 45 minutes, you would take your bag out of the solution. You would again pat the outside gently um, to get rid of any excess moisture on the outside. Now you don't want to pat and leave the uh, paper towel there too long or it's gonna wick some of the water out, but you just wanna get rid of the excess on the outside. After you do that, you would take that bag, you would reweigh it, and you would record the new weight. Once you record the new weight, then you would determine how much the weight changed. Did the bag gain weight? What does that mean if the bag gains weight? Did the water go into or out of the bag? If the bag gains weight, right, if it weighs more at the end, that tells us that the water went into the bag. If on the flip side, the, the weight of the bag is less than the initial, right? If the final weight is less, that means that the bag lost weight, which means that the water left the bag. And that tells us something about the concentration of the urine. And so in a minute, I will go through kind of how do we analyze this data and how do we determine the solute concentration of the urine based on this experiment. But it, it comes down to making your four dialysis tubes, recording the weight, put them in the different solutions, after 45 minutes, reweigh the bag and look at the weight change. Did the bag gain weight? Did the bag lose weight? And you're gonna use that information to determine the concentration of the solutes in the urine. Part two is looking at the effect of molecular weight on diffusion. And so the way that this is done is you would have a Petri dish and this dish contains auger. And auger is a substance derived from seaweed. And you can think of auger like jello, right? And so when you buy uh, jello, right, if you've ever made jello, it's a powder, right? You mix the powder with water, you have to heat it up the powder dissolves and then you let it cool and it solidifies into a gelatin. Auger is very much the same way. It's a powder. We add water to it, right? We add water to it. We heat it up to get the um, auger to dissolve and then we cool it down. We pour that auger into these Petri dishes and we end up with these auger plates and the auger again contains that kind of gelatin substance. Now, what you would do is, and again, you're gonna see this in the video, you would make two little wells, meaning you're gonna make, you would make two holes in the auger and you would remove this auger. So notice that it's grayed out. And what that means is we would use a cork borer and we would remove this little circle of auger. And we would do that twice and we would spread them out. Now, you have your two circles that don't have auger, what you would do is we have two dyes or two substances that we're testing the rate of diffusion. We have ESNY. ESNY has a molecular weight of 692 grams per mole. Silver nitrate, on the other hand, has a molecular weight of 170 grams per mole. And so what you would do is you would take the eosin um, you would have a dropper of it, and you would add enough eosin until the eosin gets to about the top of the well. You don't want it overflowing, um, but you do want it pretty close to the top. The other circle you would fill with the silver nitrate. And so what we're doing in this experiment is we're looking at how molecular weight affects the rate of diffusion. And so I told you, to go back um, and make a prediction about if you thought the lower molecular weight would diffuse faster or the higher molecular weight would diffuse faster, right? You had to make your prediction. So how are we determining which one has the fastest rate of diffusion? 
Well, in this well, we're putting our dye. So we're putting our eosin. And that dye is going to move from its high concentration in the well to the low concentration outside, meaning the dye is going to start to diffuse through the auger. And the same is going to happen with the silver nitrate. And so what you would do is after, um, after you let this sit for a period of time, again, you're going to watch the video to get the data, but what you would do is you would see that your dye is going to diffuse into the auger and you're going to compare how much it diffused by measuring the diameter, the distance from one end to the other, and mine's not very centered. Let me try that again. Okay, you would measure the diameter and record the diameter in millimeters. So basically you want to see how far did the dye move from the well. And you would compare that for the eosin and the silver nitrate. Now, what are you looking for in order to determine which one diffused the best? Are you looking for the greater the diameter or the lower the diameter? So the greater the diameter, is the faster rate of diffusion, right? Because that would mean if your diameter is really large, right? So let me just compare two on the same one. If instead it diffused this purple amount, right? If the diameter is larger, that means that the dye diffused more. It was able to move through the auger faster. So that's what you're looking at in this experiment. And again, you're going to want to watch the video and see the setup and also get the data for this experiment. And then the last part is looking at the effect of temperature on the rate of diffusion. So in this experiment, the, what you would do is you would obtain three beakers. And in your three beakers, you would fill them with tap water and you would subject them to different temperatures. So one temperature would be room temperature, one temperature would be cold, meaning the water would be from the refrigerator, and the other temperature would be the what's considered the hot temperature, which is that we would actually take that beaker of water and we would heat it up. And so we have cold, warm, and um, hot. And what we're looking for in this experiment is of those three temperatures, which one has the fastest rate of diffusion? Now, again, at the beginning, you were to make a prediction of how temperature affects the rate of diffusion, right? Did you predict that the higher the temperature, the faster the rate of diffusion, or the lower the temperature? So you have your three beakers. They're at your three temperatures. You would record the temperature of those three water solutions, and then you would start a timer add red dye to all three of the beakers. So you would add the same amount of dye to all three of the beakers, and then you would watch and see how long does it take for the dye to be evenly distributed, meaning how long does it take for the dye to reach equilibrium? And so you would see which one does this occur faster. Did it spread out faster in the higher temperature the colder temperature, or the one in the middle. And so you add your food coloring, you don't move your beaker, and you watch for diffusion for five minutes. And you would record the amount of time it took for the dye to diffuse. Now let's say we get to five minutes and the dye has not diffused fully within five minutes. You, don't, you wouldn't need to keep doing this experiment. You would just record that as more than five minutes. And so that's our experiment looking at the effect of temperature on the rate of diffusion. And so again, you want to watch the video that goes with this um, to get your data and to actually see your setup. So your instructions for this lab is to watch the video provided by Professor Liu. Um, it shows you the experimental setup and the data that you will use for the lab. 
I have provided the link here. Um, so here is the link for YouTube. And I will also be embedding this in our canvas shell for you to look at. Okay, but you need to watch that video. And you want to look at the setup and how you would have done the experiment. And then the data, so Professor Liu actually did the experiment. And she presented the data in that, in that video. And so you would record the data for table 8-1. Um, but she gave you the initial weight and the final weight. You yourself need to calculate the weight change and the percent weight change. And I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to go through a different example of this um, to show you how do you calculate this. Table 8-2 is from experiment 1. So it's the same as 8-1, except that 8-2 was supposed to be the class data. Now, obviously, we don't have class data for this because we just ran one experiment. So you can cross out table 8-2 because you're not going to use class data. You will use the data from table 8-1 for your graph. So your um, lab tells you to use the class data, which normally we would want to use because it would be an average of everybody's results. However, for this lab, because we don't have class data, just go ahead and use table 8.1 for your graph. And again, I'm going to walk through how do we analyze the data from table 8.1. So let's look at that. All right, so this, what I'm going to show you, these are example calculations. Do not use this for your data um, in, your, in your experiment. Use the numbers provided by Professor Liu. This is just to give you an example and to show you how these calculations work. And to make this easier, I oversimplified by making the initial weight the same. Right, and so I said that they all started at 12 grams. If you were doing this in the lab, that's not very likely. The chance that they all weigh exactly the same is pretty low. Um, but for the simplicity of this, I'm going to keep it simple and they all start at 12 grams. So what that means is that I sealed one end of, our, of my dialysis tube. I would add my 10 milliliters of urine. I would seal the other end pat it dry, and then put that dialysis tube on the scale and record the weight. And so what this is saying is that when I recorded that initial weight, the weight was 12 grams. Now, I take that dialysis tube and I put it into one of my four solutions, either deionized water, 5% solute, 10% solute, or 15 and so what we're looking at is we want to see how the weight changes, um, how the weight changes in those dialysis tubes. So let's just look at an example. So let's say we're comparing the dialysis tube versus deionized water, right? So there's urine in the dialysis tube and there's no solutes outside. So what do you think we would call the deionized water? What do we call that solution relative to the urine, right? The urine's yellow. Is it likely to have solutes? And the answer is yes. The urine in the bag is likely to have solutes. The solution outside, the deionized water, is not going to have solutes. So we would call the deionized water, this would be hypotonic relative to the bag, right? Because my bag is going to have some solutes in it. And my deionized water is not. So if I have my hypotonic solution, let me change my ink, but I have solutes inside. And in this example, um, the dialysis tube is not permeable to the solutes, but it is permeable to the water. So the water is able to cross this artificial membrane. If you put the dialysis tube in a hypotonic solution, would you expect the bag to gain weight or to lose weight? Right? And so where is the water concentration higher? And that is we have more free 
water in the dialysis, uh, in the deionized water. So we have more water outside. And so we would expect, pen's being funny, uh, we would expect that the water would go into the, the dialysis tube. So what would we expect to happen to the weight change? In the deionized water, do we expect that bag to gain weight, lose weight, or stay the same? And the answer is, we would expect that it would gain weight, right? Because if the water goes in, the bag should get heavier. On the flip side, let's say, for example, let's go to the other extreme. So in this example, 15% solute. We're going to have a lot of solutes. relative to the urine. So what would I call the 15% relative to the bag? And I would say that this solution is hypertonic. It has more solutes in the solution relative to the dialysis tubing. Where would I have more free water? In the solution or in the bag? And the answer is in the bag, more free water. And so in this example, is the water going to go into or out of the bag? If there's more water inside, the water is going to come out, right? If there's more water inside, the water is going to come out. And what is going to happen to the weight of the bag? Is the bag going to gain weight or lose weight? If the water comes out, the bag is going to lose weight, right? It's going to lose weight because water came out. And so if you do this and you record your final weight, I'm just going to give you some example numbers. Again, this is not what you use for your experiment, but just to kind of give you an example. So let's say at the end, I recorded my final weight. So I had put my bags in the solution. I waited 45 minutes. After 45 minutes, I pat the excess water off the outside, and then I put them on the scale and record the weight. So notice that the deionized water gained weight. It went from 12 grams to 14. The 5% solute gained a little bit of weight. But starting at the 10% solute, um, it lost weight. So notice it started at 12, it went down to 10.5. The 15%, it went down to 9 grams. So the next row of my table would be where I calculate the weight change. So I take my final weight and subtract the initial weight. So in the first example, it started at four, or it started at 12 and it went to 14. So the weight change is plus two grams. It gained two grams. The next one gained 0.5. The next one, notice the weight change, the number 10.5 minus 12. So what you end up with in that case is a negative number, which indicates that it lost weight. So here is the data, right? So this is plus two grams. Um, the next one is plus 0.5. Um, the next one is negative 1.5 grams, and then the last one is negative 3 grams. So that would be my calculated weight change. Now, there normally in this experiment would be variation in how much the bags weighed at the beginning. So we don't want to use just weight change. Instead, we want to look at what we call the percent weight change. So what percentage did the weight change? So to calculate that, notice up here I put percent weight change. So you take your weight change, divide it by your initial weight, multiply by 100. So I would, in the first example for the deionized water, I would take the 2, I would divide by 12, and multiply by 100. And I would do that for all of these. And so my percent weight changes would look like this. So the first one... The percent weight change is positive, meaning it gained that much weight. So it gained 14.3%. The next 
The next one gained 4.2%. Uh, notice for the 10% solute, it lost weight. So the percent weight change is negative 12.5. Don't leave that as a positive, right? That will not make sense in your experiment if that is a positive because you need to indicate that it actually lost weight. And then the 15% solute uh, lost 25% of its weight. And so this is how you would calculate this. You would watch the other video. In the video is the data, the first two rows, the initial and the final. You need to calculate your weight change. You need to calculate your percent weight change. And you need to record that in table 8-1. Now, notice when looking at this, right? If I'm looking at this, I have some of the bags gained weight, some of the bags lost weight. But just by looking at this, I don't really know what the concentration of the urine is. I still need to figure out what is the concentration of the urine. And so what I need to do is I'm going to graph this data. And what I'm going to graph is I'm going to graph the percent solute concentration and the percent weight change. So if we look at our graph, so let's go to the next page. If we look at our graph and we're graphing percent solute concentration and percent weight change, again, our um, x-axis and our y-axis on our graph, the x, remember, is going to have our independent variable and the y is going to have our dependent variable. So we want to know which depends on which. So does the percent weight change depend on the solute concentration? Or does the solute concentration depend on the percent weight change? So you have to think for a minute, which of those makes sense? Which one depends on the other? So the solute concentration does not depend on the percent weight change, right? We started with a known solute concentration on the outside. So that does not change. What changed was the percent weight change depends on the solute concentration. So depending on what concentration of solutes that bag is in, that is going to dictate how much weight change occurred. So what that tells us is that our x-axis, which is going to be our independent, is going to be our solute concentration. And our y-axis, which is our dependent, remember that the percent weight change depends on the solute concentration. So my dependent variable is going to be my percent weight change. And so I would use an appropriate scale. So let's take a look. Notice that my data points ranged from uh, positive 25% or sorry, negative 25% up to a highest of um, positive 14.2. So I have to keep that in mind when I am plotting my data. So in this case, I have zero here and then I counted each of these main lines as tens. So 10, 20, 30. Notice after zero, I go down. So negative 10, negative 20, negative 30. And you're going to have to calculate those for your data. Again, this is not your data. This is just an example. And on the x-axis, I need to have my percent solute concentration. And so I had four solute concentrations that I was testing. 0, 5, 10, and 15. Now, when we do this to determine the concentration of the urine, right, what we have is we have a percent weight change for each of those solute concentrations. So if I plot that on here, so here is my data. So my 0% gained 14.2 and my 5 gained that amount and so on and so forth. So what I do is I actually would go ahead and I would plot all my data points on my graph. Now for this one, this is going to be a scatter plot. You are not going to connect the dots. Do not connect the dots. What you're gonna do instead 
is a line of best fit. A line of best fit. So what that means is when I do this, I would use a ruler and I would hold a ruler and try and I hold it on its edge so it's kind of standing up. And I would see kind of where I could draw my line that would be in the middle of the data point. So you want data points on either side of the line. And you're gonna do this to the best of your ability. Now, obviously when you do it, everybody's lines are gonna look a little bit different depending on their interpretation. If you were doing this in Excel, Excel can give you a very accurate line of best fit. But for the purpose of this, just do your best and draw your line of best fit. So if I were to draw my line of best fit, this is what it would look like. So notice that I have some data points on the left of the line, some on the right, some that are going directly through it. That is my line of best fit. So again, do not connect your dots. Do not connect your dots, do not connect your dots. So I would draw my line of best fit. Now, you don't forget to give your graph a title. And in the title, there are several terms that you should include if you would like your title to be sufficient. Um, it needs to have uh, urine in the title, right? Again, you wanna tell me what your um, experiment is doing. What is the purpose of your experiment, right? Urine needs to be in there. Solute concentration should be in your title and either osmosis or diffusion need to be in your title. So make sure that when you write your title that you include those three words. So you need to have urine, you need to have solute concentration and osmosis or diffusion. So now back to my graph. What I need to look at is I need to look at how do I know what my percent solute concentration is of my urine? And so what I mean by that is, let's say, let me just sketch my beaker here. And here is my dialysis tube. So let's think about this for a minute. What I'm trying to do, so my question is, what is the solute concentration in the bag? That's what I'm trying to do. So notice that in my experiment, I don't know the solute concentration inside the bag, but I did in each case know the solute concentration outside. So if I think about this for a minute and I think about how to determine the concentration of the solute inside the bag, right? So if you think about it, let's say for example, If, if my solute concentration outside is the same as the concentration of the solute inside. So we have a, the same solute outside as we do inside. What do we call the solution outside relative to the solution inside if they're the same? What does it mean when we say same? So what do we call that? And the answer is isotonic. So if the bag is in an isotonic solution, the solute concentration is the same inside as it is outside. So if we have the same concentration inside and outside, do we have net movement of water? Is the bag going to gain weight, lose weight, or stay the same? And the answer is, is, if the solute concentration is equal, the water is gonna move inside and outside at the same rate. So do we get any weight change if we have no net movement of water? And the answer is no. So if we put a solution in an isotonic solution, we get no weight change. because the water is moving in and out of the bag at an equal rate. And so we get no weight change, which another way to say that is 0% weight change.
right? There is no weight change. The bag weight is going to stay the same. So to determine the concentration of the urine, right? We are looking for what concentration outside is isotonic to the bag. So again, we need to look at 0%. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna look at your 0% weight change. Don't mind my lack of a straight line. And you would go out from zero and then you would go down and whatever this number is, would be your percent weight change. So maybe in this case, my um, extrapolated um, solute concentration might be about 5.7%, right? So if I went to 0% weight change and I draw a line out, and again, it's going to your line of best fit, don't just assume that if one of your data points is close to zero, that that is gonna be the concentration. That does not always work out. You do in fact need to draw your line of best fit. And then you're gonna look where you get 0% weight change. And then that solute concentration is the concentration of the urine. Because again, the numbers on this x-axis are the percent solute concentration on the outside. When we have 0% weight change, right, when we have no weight change, that means that the bag neither gained or lost weight, right, the weight um, stayed the same. And what that tells us is that the solution outside, the concentration of solutes is the same as inside. That's the isotonic solution. So whatever solution outside has 0% weight change tells me the solute concentration inside, because that tells me that it's isotonic and the concentrations are equal. So this is what you're going to do to determine your urine solute concentration, is you're going to draw your line of best fit. So put all your data points on your graph, draw your line of best fit to the best of your ability using a ruler, make sure your line is straight, and then you're gonna look at where that line crosses 0% weight change. Wherever it crosses 0% weight change and you go down and you look at your percent solute outside, that is your concentration of your urine. This is how you're going to determine the concentration of your solute. And so you're gonna do this with the data provided in the additional video. Don't forget your title. So a couple of helpful hints um, in answering your questions on page 121. Make sure that you're very thorough. So for question number one, um, it's, it's asking you to use table 8.2. We don't have class data. So use the data from table 8.1. Um, and that is to calculate your urine concentration. Question number two, be very specific. So that question is basically asking you um, to describe how you determined the urine concentration. And so make sure on in your answer that you address what did you look for on the graph to determine solute concentrations. So what were you looking for on the graph and why? What does that mean when it's, let's say, 0% weight change? And so make sure that you're very thorough in your answer for how you determined um, the concentration of the urine. Questions three and four. It might be hard to fit in the, question, in the space provided, but I want you to make sure that you summarize your results and support using data. Notice I bolded using data. You want to support your answer using the data that you got. So question number three, is related to the effect of molecular weight on the rate of diffusion. So if your answer for number three is thorough enough, it should include the molecular weight. So you should include in your answer, silver nitrate has a molecular weight of blank 
and eosin Y has a molecular weight of blank. And the diameter that the dye diffused was blank millimeters. So make sure your answer, in order for it to be thorough, it needs to have your data. It needs to include both the molecular weight and the diameter um, that the dye diffused in millimeters. Once you use your data, then you want to have a conclusion sentence that summarizes the findings, meaning you're going to summarize. Did the higher the molecular weight have the faster rate of diffusion, or did the lower molecular weight have the faster rate of diffusion? So use your data and then have a conclusion sentence, which tells me that you understand what that data means. What is your conclusion based on that data? Question number four is along the same idea. Um, it's looking at the effect of temperature. So in your answer for question number four, in order to be thorough enough, um, include the temperatures actually used. So don't just call the solutions hot, cold, room temperature. In your answer, you need to have the exact temperatures that were used. Okay, be specific. So include the temperatures, and you're also going to include the time it took to diffuse for each of those beakers. So how long did it take for each beaker to diffuse? Again, in some of them, you might be saying it took more than five minutes, but you want to include that. Always use your data. And then again, just like for question number three, make sure that you have a conclusion sentence that summarizes your findings. So either the higher the temperature, the faster the rate of diffusion, or the lower the temperature, the faster the rate of diffusion. And so make sure that you have a conclusion sentence that summarizes that you know what that data means. Uh, question number five is straightforward, so I didn't really add anything here. Question six is the C star question. Uh, be sure to include if the water goes into the C star or out. Which solution has a higher free water concentration? So where is there more free water? And be sure to indicate if the water outside the cell is hypertonic, hypotonic, or isotonic to the C star. So in order to be specific enough for question number six, make sure that you address all of those parts. So the, this is just to help guide you for how thorough do you need to be? And the answer is in science, you need to be very thorough. You need to use your data. You need to explain yourself clearly and accurately. And so these are the things you wanna make sure that you address. So here is your quiz eight study guide. So just read through this. Um, study from your lab, and this will help get you ready for quiz eight. Uh, then you also need to read ahead of time lab nine, which is looking at digesting macromolecules and also define the corresponding terms. And so this is your study guide to get you ready for quiz number eight.